So I, actually, I will share. I did. I do have two images that I wanted to share. So I'll just uh, do that. Can I do that? Yes. Um, so first of all, uh, just in relation to um, to Transolar, um, which is uh, the company that uh, that that um, the climate engineering company that Eric works for um, as a MD of the New York office. Um, Transolar uh, is a really interesting company. And just to mention that they have a, a history um, with the beginning of, uh, of Sol because of the School of Architecture at UL because um, we invited uh, Matthias Schuler, who's sitting in this photograph um, uh, and, and Anja Tierfelder to uh, participate in the in the setting up of the school back in 2005, and I remember, um, you know, Matthias was extremely interested in in doing this because he wanted uh, the School of Architecture or a new School of Architecture to have, um, um, uh, let's say, not just a kind of a you know a, a strong. Uh, uh, environmental underpinnings or something like that. But I think we were all thinking about how do we reframe um, the subject matter um, that gets brought into an architecture school. Um, and typically, I think, uh, uh, you know, we talk about the environment now much more than than we ever did, let's say, in the course of my lifespan anyway. Um, and in architecture school, much, much more. And the reframing of the subject is also about how society in general is reframing it. Um, and I think uh, that meant that um, we needed to, well, kind of erase everything that had been, uh, let's say, all of the kind of tacit knowledge prescribed textbooks, uh, you know, the approaches that had been handed down over the years were all pretty much obsolete. So, um, you know, I think that that uh, Matthias was really interested in 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 how this could influence uh, the starting of a new school of architecture, and one of the first things that 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 we did uh, with Matthias was bring um, I think this is like in the first couple of days of this of the school of architecture's existence. Um, there's a kind of a big entrance plaza um, in the front of UL. Anybody who's been there kind of knows this big sloping glass wall, um, and and. Uh, we took all of the models that the students were making, and these are kind of uh, boxes that were about uh, shaping light. We brought them outside, um, and so that everybody who was walking into the university had to awkwardly walk by, uh, wondering what the heck we were doing. Um, and but this was this kind of thing of not just uh, um, you know kind of uh, being inside the school of architecture and carrying out experiments that, uh, in this case, you know, was all about daylight. Um, was something that should happen, you know, in a civic place or in a public place um, that everybody should have, have have access to so that this kind of reframing of the environmental question was also uh, a matter of study and a matter of detail that needed to be, uh, you know, cast into a, into a public light. Um, and I think that this uh, uh, is a really a kind of fundamental uh, aspect of, of the reason and the way that Transolar as, as a company and as an organization um, presents itself uh, to, uh, to the uh, kind of to the world, but also to the, to the industry that works in, in, in architectural design and, and, and in construction um, by calling themselves climate engineers and by uh, being a composition of or a team that in, includes people uh, who are who are engineers and are trained as engineers, um, but also people who are scientists and who are trained as scientists, um, and I think that this interesting mix of of science and engineering, in other words, this kind of fact-based curiosity that's tested constantly in laboratory situations or in kind of laboratory environments. Um, I don't mean inside, I just mean with the, I, the ethical idea or the philosophical idea of a laboratory. Um, together with uh, engineering, which is, you know, fundamentally about kind of mobilizing technology in some very specific direction as an understanding the constraints and limits within which it operates. Um, has been a really potent and powerful uh, kind of trans 
transformative, has had a transformative impact on, on how many, many architects think about the environment. And I'm speaking specifically about who Transolar have worked with um, and how they work. Um, so anyway, today uh, we're really lucky uh, to have Eric uh, join us um, from, from New York. And thank you, Eric, for, for getting up extra early and, um, uh, and, and, and joining us this way. Um, uh, Eric uh, studied at, at, at Purdue University um, in the United States, and then he did his, his graduate work at MIT. Um, and before he joined Transolar to run their New York office, uh, he was the uh, administrator of green projects for the city of Chicago. Um, so, you know, Eric has uh, kind of tremendous experience also working. I, you know, I think it's safe to say that it's, 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 uh, you know, working in in the uh, environment, which is fundamentally the you know the U.S. construction industry and the U.S. kind of um, architectural uh, uh, kind of uh, architectural industry, is a little bit different from um, what's going on in Europe. And I think uh, Transolar is in an interesting organization in that, without an enormous footprint, I mean they're not a huge huge company, um, they're able to span um these continents which have you know and we know this politically very very well very very different approach to, to climate change um and to how we're thinking about environments um and what what we should be doing with them so um i thought it would be really interesting to uh to get eric's uh kind of perspective um on what a climate engineer is to a bunch of architects and architectural students um and people who are thinking about architecture um and uh, r recognizing um, the fact that, uh, you know, Trans Transolar have had a long involvement in uh, the, in Irish architecture um, and, and in the development of Irish architectural education, as, 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 I, as I said it out there. So I'll stop sharing my screen um, and I'll turn it over to Eric. Um, thank you very much. I'm going to start my timer here. I'm going to try to just tear through some material in 30 minutes so that we leave plenty of time for for discussion that just it's always a really a difficult question to answer what is a climate engineer is what is climate engineering so I'm gonna kind of give some overall perspective on what we aim to accomplish in our work and just highlight projects super super quick and then do a couple more deep dives about how do we accomplish that um, and kind of skipping over the moral motivation for the most part regarding climate change and so on with the, in the interest of time with the assumption that uh, everyone understands all of that. Uh, I mean, you already touched on this that I think I, I agree that we're lucky that we uh, our footprint far outweighs our size of really about 50 to 60 people practicing across what's really three offices now Munich Stuttgart and, and New York and all the blue dots represent places where we had projects. We also have this academy program that we started ourselves in Stuttgart where students from majority world disadvantaged countries are invited to Stuttgart after they finished their kind of formal studies with the idea that they should learn something and go back to the place that they're from uh, and do something there. So that's what all the yellow dots are. And so that adds a wonderful diversity for us also of getting the perspectives and lessons from these people from all these places around the world where we might not be able to work. Um, I mean, the, the, the moral responsibility in a bit is just talking about like our, our philosophy as a practice of this, this very basic thing that we want to improve things. And I increasingly, we talk about our role in a project is sort of as a, a catalyst in a project. Clients have a really hard time understanding what we do because we don't produce any documents any final construction documents. All we're doing is pushing and prodding and doing studies and developing ideas, which will all end up in the, the rest of the design team's formal documents, so to speak. But on a successful project, I would say that you see our hand, hand everywhere. Um, and as a company, I have really grown to describe our purpose as providing, supporting, fostering innovation. Um, as climate engineers, like we this idea that things should not be over engineered static placeless unhealthy and uninspiring and that engineering plays a role in working together with design to accomplish that uh, and, but what that also what that means is that projects need to be doing something a little bit different than business as usual and if they're not looking for that then we we, we end up wondering a little bit what we're there for um this was transolar's first very first project that 
Matthias and a few others did starting all the way back in 1992 data group. It's a office for a IT company outside of Stuttgart in the kind of, uh, you know, suburban area of Stuttgart. And it still today kind of encapsulates a lot of the idea of core of what we're doing. And I, yeah, and it's still occupied and in use. We're not going to review it in detail, but for me, it's fun to go back and uh, look at something like that, which is perhaps an architecture of that time. But uh, all those philosophies are still what we see in our work today, which I really describe when we talk about innovation. We say we're climate engineers, we focus on climate responsive design. Um, and I, I, I thought about pulling out an older lecture for you today also, so just to pause on that for a moment where I talked about what does it mean to be climate responsive and it, that a lot of contemporary architecture has come to see the role of the architecture to only mediate with the exterior environment that almost every climate in the world has times when it's really nice outside and you want to bring that condition indoors and at those times you're engaging and so the fundamental idea of climate engineering is how do you take architecture which is thing is seen as a static object and make it interact with this dynamic environment where there are times that you want to engage and there are times you want to mediate and that that's perhaps is an overarching goal of these four major topics that I really think that we focus on providing innovation and in. when we look at our portfolio we see that uh, projects we consider successfully successful have some kind of innovation in one of these four topics the user-centered design and access to natural light site-specific dynamic environments for a sense of identity and delight comprehensive design for smaller simpler cost-effective robust building systems and and high performance and harmony with inspiring architecture. And, and don't don't worry, we don't. We're going to go through and just look at some more examples very quickly for each of these. What do we mean by that? And then we'll look at just a couple examples, or maybe I have put in three of how do we how do we accomplish that? So user centered design and access to natural light and air, which for improved occupant productivity and also for wellness. Uh, I think that the, especially the COVID conversation, and, and at least in the States, I think probably very different than in Ireland, like uh, just arguing for the fact that being able to open a window in a commercial building should be a human right and that it's unconscionable to put people in steel buildings. It used to be very hard. The COVID conversation has made it easier as people realize how risky it is to rely only on mechanical systems to deliver all of the healthy, fresh air for a building. Um, but, but this can manifest itself in, in really different ways. And th this is just sort of a contrasting of very low tech versus very high tech. Uh, so this is a project in, uh, Damascus. It's a French school, um, private school, which really has no mechanical ventilation, no mechanical cooling. Uh, the heating systems are nearly non-existent and you can see the kind of shallow classrooms result of a kind of campus planning that is these pods that are just pairs of classrooms stacked up one on top of one another where they can receive light from both sides um, and this project draws air in to earth tubes that are located underneath the slab here um, in order to pre-cool that air when it's very warm outside um, and then at night they open the windows as well so that the whole space can get cooled down and we love to show this project because the kind of climate diagram uh, translates very, very literally into the, the section that you see. You can see so literally in the photo here with air flowing in from this side in through those earth tubes when the windows are closed to the pair of classrooms here and then up and out of these solar chimneys exhausting at the top that are driving the whole flow through. And you have the vegetated courtyards with some shading which further cool things, provide pre-cooling of air before it even makes it into those, those uh, classrooms and so on. Um, you can, we can contrast that with really aiming to achieve the exact same type of outcome, but with a very different type of architecture, very different program, very different climate. This is uh, Manitoba Hydro Place in Winnipeg. Uh, so it's an office tower for the utility company there uh, with uh, KPMB architects from Toronto, who we do a lot of work with. Um, 
And here it's a very, very glassy building, but again, designed with uh, a really kind of breathing building idea where there's a double facade to allow you to be able to open windows in this uh, uh, high rise where wind pressure would otherwise be a problem. It also allows it to have operable shading on the east and west facades. This facade that you see here is facing west uh, where shading would normally be, be a big problem, but once you put it inside of a facade, a uh, double facade where it's protected from the, the wind, it becomes less problematic. Uh, and there's these south facing winter gardens, which really make the wonderful intense direct sunlight that they have only from the south in the winter there available in a shared space for everyone that they can use. Um, and so it's the, the result is that they operate in natural, it's the coldest climate in the Western hemisphere of a major city, goes down to minus 40 C, which for me as an American is really easy to remember because it's the same as minus 40 F. Um, and so it's super cold, but also has the kind of Midwestern plains, hot and humid summer, but they still open the windows for 35%, nearly 40% of the year. Um, and because of the fairly thin for a North American tower uh, footprint, they have quite good daylight penetration as well. But it's very glassy, it has a lot of systems, it has a double facade, same outcome with high tech versus low tech. Uh, the next kind of outcome is this idea of site specific dynamic environments for a sense of identity and delight. Uh, and for this, I think the, the clearest example is uh, Jean Nouvel's uh, Louvre Abu Dhabi with the huge perforated dome and the smattering of different gallery buildings underneath the, the dome. Uh, many of you are perhaps familiar with it and the basic inspiration for that was that he really wanted to create this effect of a rain of light recreating the experience in an underneath the palm trees in, oas in an oasis there where because of the dust and the contrast of light, you can see the rays of light coming down through the perforations. And so we were very heavily involved in the testing, true laboratory testing, as Merritt was uh, talking about, to, uh, it's so relevant that you showed those kind of uh, outdoor daylight test, Merritt, in your introduction, because that's what that was, this was basically that writ very large to, uh, to confirm that, that this effect that you see in the photo here, the rays of light coming down and that they're visible, uh, would actually happen, which is all about actually determining the amount of perforation that is allowable in the dome. You, you can't let too much light in because it needs you need to have the high contrast for it to be to be legible. And that project consisted of a lot of different testing of that. That's on a more visual basis. It's kind of same idea on a thermal basis is uh, this is Zaryaja Park in Moscow. It's a Diller Scafidio project. Um, the idea of the project overall was to recreate all of the biomes of Russia together in one park. The sort of the, uh, the big announcement moment is this glass dome over a hill. And the, the basic idea of this was be able, to be able to create a more comfortable place that could be years, used year round in Moscow or fairly cold in the winter. Um, and it's deliberately shaped and there was a lot of studies to allow heat to be trapped underneath this glass dome that's sitting on top of the hill so that warm air rises up. You have the greenhouse effect, but you see that there's no enclosure around the sides. It's just an outdoor space that flows totally through and there had to be a strategy for uh, blocking the wind in, on the other side so that the wind wouldn't just blow all the warm air you're trying to trap just straight, straight out. Uh, for us, this was a kind of really satisfying when that was built of the kind of money shot on Instagram where somebody was posting that it was snow covered Moscow outside and they still had the green lawn up underneath the dome where it was much, much warmer, which is the entire uh, intent of that. Um, one more is the project with Buchholz McAvoy is the Toronto Region and Region Conservation Authority where we spent a lot of time together thinking about how you respond to this site, which is at the edge of the urban area of Toronto and this kind of really interesting urban forested interface. That's me and, and Karen and the local architect that is standing out in the field at the site there. I love this photo so much, Mary. It's just like shows how amazing the site is. Um, yeah, she had to put a building up. on that site. Yeah, I know, yeah. It's, uh, 
Well, but so you, we did it. We, you know, we had a good time together then of really thinking about how do you respond to that. And I would say in this context of being site specific, besides being mass timber and so on, another thing I think is really special about the building is that th this view is not really, it's not lying. The, uh, because we worked very hard to eliminate stand rooms and so on in the building, in many locations, you'd be able to stand in one spot and you'll have views out in all four directions of the building, like really keeping it very, very engaged with the forest. That's kind of the idea of site specific dynamic environments. Next is comprehensive design for simpler, smaller, cost effective and robust building systems. Uh, this is the uh, Bangkok airport with uh, Murphy Yan, Helmut Yan. Um, was really one of the first large projects that brought us out of Germany and onto the international scene in the early 2000s. And this was the architectural vision from the beginning of these very large transparent membrane spaces. And before we were on the project, they, they were being told the only way to possibly deal with this is to put huge ducts massive amounts of cold air trying to condition this whole space and deal with the heat gain. Uh, and we went back to the kind of basics and really rethought it, both the construction of the roof so that it's a custom triple layer membrane roof with some special properties, including a low E on the underside so that you don't have the heat that builds up on the roof radiating down. There's a radiant floor and all the uh, ventilation air comes out of this these low displacement diffusers. So there's an intentional stratification with it staying cool down here and letting it be warm. And this completely changed and eliminated that need for massive amounts of systems and energy in order to keep the space cool. Um, on a smaller scale, it's another Buchholz McAvoy project. This is SAP Galway, um, which uh, really takes advantage of the kind of wonderfully cool Irish climate and by decentralizing systems, I have got to take care of the dogs. You just to hold on. There. Decentralizing systems uh, down to the, uh, that this is all they consist of in the building basically and totally integrated in the facade and dealing with very, it's a call center, very high cooling loads. Uh, how do you just bring in a lot of outside air and that's cool enough without making it uncomfortable and using these to, mix that so that it becomes comfortable and then having a small heating element. So these are both really good examples of what we mean by smaller, simpler, more robust building systems. And it's moving to a totally different climate in Singapore. This is a, a very new project. It's the School of Architecture in Singapore at the National University of Singapore, um, which is very climate responsive with the exterior, with the super deep shading and a lot of studies of shading and glare there. Um, but the systems again are actually extremely minimal um only delivering a small amount of tempered air and nothing else but providing ceiling fans and having a lot of discussion on what comfort conditions are acceptable um, and then that topic can really be extended to materials which is growing more and more as embodied carbon has become such a big topic this is a, a, probably the very first project in which we really engage with the embodied carbon topic in I would say it sat dormant for quite a while after this project, now it's coming back. Uh, this is a Hertog and Demeron project in Switzerland for Ricola, the cough drop manufacturers. And this is where they have herb storage and some manufacturing. Uh, but the whole thing is monolithic rammed earth. Uh, and that was approved meeting the very stringent Swiss energy code by comparing the, the total life cycle carbon emissions associated with if foam plastic insulation were included in order to meet the Swiss energy code, what is the embodied energy of that foam plastic as compared to the super low embodied energy of the kind of, of the monolithic grand earth wall and that was accepted. Um, my last topic, uh, example of what we mean by, uh, by these kind of innovation outcomes, high performance in harmony with inspiring architecture I'm going to go through these a little bit faster because I want to save time for my other examples. Um, but just some of the other work that uh, are just examples of, you know, the, the architecture really responding to place and are we have a role in that. This is Grace Farms with Sana um, in Connecticut, uh, which is 
our work ended up being a lot about the depth of these overhangs and how these overhangs work and what is the super insulation of the roof to counteract for the extreme transparency they were trying to maintain in the insulated glass. So the, the glass is, has no coating and is not nearly as good as you might typically see. And we tried to compensate that for the roof. Um, this is the uh, Herning Art Museum in Denmark with Stephen Hall and uh, a lot of kind of museums with Stephen where we work on both the environmental systems and the daylight. Another architecture school, architecture schools love <laughs> they're they're the one of the best clients for us because they really understand the idea of being climate responsive. So it's the uh, Clemson Architecture School. This is a Tom Pfeiffer project um, using these skylights for not, this kind of wonderful uh, diffuse daylight everywhere indoors. I ha it's in the south, south, south in South Carolina in the U.S. It has natural ventilation and everything, and it's uh, actually a, a fairly low budget project. Uh, we also get frustrated that it's like the really high profile stuff is what tends to get published, but there's a lot of smaller or more modest projects aiming at the same goals. This is a called the Guardian Glass House. It was plopped in the desert, the Andalusian desert in Spain, um, and it was meant to be a, a demonstration of, of Guardian Glass. Uh, but it's a net zero energy off the grid by even by necessity. You see, there's no utility hookups or anything. It has a water tank and the water is tanked, is trucked in. But otherwise, it's completely self-sufficient with a PV uh, panel on the roof and uh, batteries tucked away and inside. And so the energy use has to be absolutely minimized while still constructing a tiny, tiny home, basically, almost completely out of glass. Um, and then maybe it's just kind of natural ending point of that is the installations that we do mostly on our own. The first of which was the, the cloudscapes installation at the Venice Biennale, which in 2010, which are really sort of an illustration of what we mean by climate engineering here, creating a cloud that you can walk up through above and back down. Uh, so I, I want to take 10 more minutes to try to cruise through just a couple examples of though none of these deliberately show any of the simulation or data or anything because I believe very much what matters is what gets built in the end, the experience there, and then the, the performance with regard to uh, real utility bills and so on. All the simulation sketches and thinking and so on is all only in support of that. And so that's why I really like to begin by showing built work. How do we accomplish that? Um, I like to describe these kind of three outcomes, which you could say apply to almost any practice that's doing a, a good job, but uh, uh, the, or these three attitudes, not outcomes, sorry, uh, that we really apply in our work regarding ask the right questions, listen and understand and, and embrace creative uncertainty. And uh, I don't have time to, to dive into all of these in great detail, but I'm gonna just give a couple examples. So the first is what do we mean by asking the right questions? And one, one example of that is that we ask questions and try to force the whole team to focus, maybe force is too strong of a word, but to, to encourage the whole team to, to, to be focusing on the same question. And I would say traditionally, each discipline is just dealing with their own set of problems. And when they come together, they're only ensuring they don't step on each other's toes in a way and in, in how they interface. And uh, if the conversation is totally different if we all understand and bring our unique perspectives to answering the same question. Uh, so this is a dorm at the University of Chicago is a competition we did with with Studio Gang from Chicago uh, ends up with large west facing facades that again we need shading. This is south facing. These are this is at eight stories um, and they're uh, you know just stacked dormitory units. We tend to really focus on thinking about the occupied individual room scale together with how that relates to the overall massing and here an immediate goal was to have good natural ventilation for which we normally would aim for cross ventilation but this was designed build with a contractor who said this requires fire dampers and would be way too expensive as a total no-go so we said okay dorm rooms it can work like this but you need a lot of open area and then the whole team started agreeing well that's challenging because uh, in the States, we normally have to design with this four inch opening limitation for fall protection, which makes it very difficult to get very large uh, opening areas in the facade. 
So they started sketching some ideas about how do you combine responding to that sun and shading what with getting a very large uh, operable uh, opening with the fall protection. This is a, an idea that didn't go anywhere. We meanwhile were doing simulations to determine how much shading is actually enough. Uh, and this was the first sketch back from them really uh, showing what the final solution was there. We have a perforated shading screen outboard uh, and a side hinge window that swings inward so that the shading screen is contributing to the shading and providing the fall protection, which seems kind of obvious in retrospect, but you know the, the best solutions obvious often are obvious in retrospect, but not so obvious until you get there. And then we did the kind of analysis to show what the benefit of that is that if you can only open a window like that four inches, you're only going to open it 10% of the year. But once you have this, this shading reducing heat gain and you can open the window all the way, now it's 30% of the year. And this specific solution, none of us would have arrived at individually. It was only through studying the problem together and using our kind of different lenses that, uh, and defining what the problem was that we came to this solution. That's the rendering. This is the built product. Of course, for them, there was a lot of study of the pattern of the screen, how that related to the pattern of the facade, and that became a big element of the project overall. Uh, I'm going to skip over listen and understand, which is very, very kind of practice oriented thing of how do we communicate with clients, uh, both with architects, the rest of the design team, but especially with the, the kind of final owner client because our work tends to very much challenge their, their notions of what they think they want. Uh, and so there requires a lot of listening and understanding on our part of what their needs are, but on their part of why we, what we think we're proposing might work for them after all, if they open their mind a little bit. Um, and but I'm going to jump to embrace creative uncertainty, which, which I have two more examples. Um, the first is, I think is, just really important, and that's the fact that climate responsive design is not inherently deterministic. I think this is one of the biggest resistances we see actually from architects, especially those with a very strong, you know, design opinion who fear that working with somebody who's going to act as a climate engineer, well, they're going to tell me what to do. They're going to tell me it has to be X, Y, and Z, uh, which I think is really very far from the actual case. So this is an unbuilt project that didn't make it past concept design, but it was a really great concept process. It was for Genentech, a pharmaceutical company in South San Francisco. It's right by the airport in San Francisco. And the architect, which is flat associates from San Francisco, they're producing all kinds of uh, different massings, doing this kind of full exploration. It was actually the client that brought us in uh, and said, okay, uh, architect, please work with them. And I, I think that the client very much expected that we would tell them, okay, this is the best one. You should really encourage the architect to take this massing, um, and this is why nothing else is acceptable. And they were a bit surprised when we refused to do that, as they narrowed in on three really different massings, which were different uh, for, you know, camp this was, they had a sort of a campus there, and so this was for campus contextual reasons. They were, thinking about different ways of responding to campus. It's actually quite mild there. They have very strong continuous wind from the west. And so we said, we, let's really work with that. We should be able to do only a naturally ventilated building with no cooling. But the, the facade and the massing has to be set up to work with that. But we felt that each of these massings was workable. They simply required different responses. We would apply different things to the facades in different ways and build those up to make the building work as a system in different ways. Um, so we ended up describing a kind of toolkit of different facade building blocks, performative aspects of facades that we described what those would mean notionally, and then how those we would apply those in different ways in different combinations on different facades of these massings. And, and then maybe the, the, each of the massings, maybe if they needed small adjustments or we felt that they could be tweaked, then uh, we worked through that as well, but it wasn't that wholesale they wouldn't work. Sometimes it is true that I mean, the solution space is broad, but there are things that are simply won't work. Like often, for example, the fully glazed facade with no shading at all often is a, a no-go, although not, not always. Um, so for, for me, this is just a really good illustration of the idea that any three of these would have been equally acceptable for us. 
we just have different design responses of how to make them make them work and that may result in different construction costs and that may end up influencing the final decision of which one to use but uh, from a totally neutral is it possible or not perspective it's definitely not not deterministic uh, the last example I want to fly through is this design manifestation of an idea can drastically change and how something can emerge through the design process as well. This is a very small project, but uh, one that I really love. It's with uh, two by four, who's really a graphic design firm that does a little bit of uh, architecture as well here in New York. And um, this is the Hyundai Motor Studio in Beijing. It's in the 798 Arts District, uh, which is a bunch of former munitions factories that's been converted into all different kinds of art galleries. So this isn't a uh, car dealership, it's a branding space basically for Hyundai where they show art and then they talk some about their kind of modern technologies and green technologies and so on. And so then this is what the building looked like before the project happened. And it was a renovation of uh, part, part of the first floor and second floor for this. And the reason we were brought onto the project was really because Hyundai had said they wanted to provide the cleanest air in Beijing. Um, that's what they had told two by four and they said, oh, we know who is interesting to help us with that. We looked at that and said, well, that's really hard to make visible or something to celebrate because it's, it's important to have clean air, but actually at the scale of a room or a building, you actually can't see clean air and you can't really see polluted versus dirty air very clearly across the scale of that scale. So we reinterpreted it as make visible and self-evident that uh, you have the cleanest air in Beijing. Uh, and we started the project with that kind of premise. How do we make it very, very obvious as part of the experience in this building that you have the cleanest air in Beijing? And did all these different brainstorms of different places, where do we put the filtration? How do we handle exhaust air, realizing that there used to be chimneys in this area because they were factories. And so that's an interesting historical inspiration. Um, thinking a lot about biofiltration, learning more about that, kind of come to the conclusion it doesn't do that much, but it also sends a very strong message and it does do something. So thinking about integrating green walls for filtration, thinking about lasers and prisms and things for visualizing the amount of pollutants, diffraction. We thought about the kind of canary in the coal mine type idea. Um, and we settled on this idea to, of having knowing that to actually accomplish that clean air in a challenging place like Beijing, it needs heavy filtration, HEPA filters and carbon filters uh, that ha and it's going to be done mechanically. Um, so we had the idea of making that very visible by entering through a vestibule where air has passed on the exterior through a green wall. And then you're in this vestibule and you see this huge bank of filters, which is what's filtering the air that in the rest of the space you're going to go into. Uh, and then combining that with an exhaust of an added chimney that is coming out. And so we really ran with that for a while and they were developing what that vestibule would look like, having that green wall on the exterior, uh, more and more sketches of kind of developing that idea. And at some point, this is probably two months of that, they realized together with the client, this vestibule idea was just not gonna work because they didn't have the space for it. It was just taking up too much uh, sacrificing too much programming area uh, and the filters need to be very large. And so they started looking at some other tacks of making it visible, but not having it be literally in the vestibule. Uh, and this is more the final direction that it took, where it was kind of creating this line from inside to outside uh, and creating what is essentially an air handling unit, but one like that no one has seen before because it's completely glass so that the whole process is visible while keeping the idea of those exhaust chimneys, which really led to this idea of what was formerly a dirty air factory is now a clean air factory. Um, so this is one of the one of the final renderings before it really made it to its final form. This is even closer to the final form. This is under construction, but now you have this air handling unit poking through the wall that still has a green wall where the outside air intake is on the back side of this thing here. Um, and the final kind of built project with a screen on the underside, we'll look at a bit, bit. and there's also this kind of double facade uh, terrain thing. The landscape architect on this was uh, Gunter Vogt from uh, Liechtenstein, who was also really, really a, a delight to work with. 
as, as conceptually challenging as we, I know that we, we can be. Um, and here's this air handling unit continuing on the inside, that really showing all of the components that are necessary to deal with the problem of the heavily polluted air in Beijing. Uh, and then this screen on the underside, uh, two by fours and their graphic designers, they designed this screen showing in real time, what is the measured uh, concentration of different things? In this case, it's PM 2.5 defined dust, and you can see how it falls off as it passes through the filters from a, a heavy concentration to a much finer concentration. And so the density of dots is representing that. So I really see those attitudes as very kind of fundamental to the way that we, we work as climate engineers. They still haven't shown any performance simulation, which is really core to answering the engineering questions, but that's always in service of these kind of broader, broader goals of how we're working. And so that's why I uh, avoid emphasizing it and talking about what are we trying to accomplish in our projects. So I'll stop there when we have time to discuss. Uh, that's fantastic, Eric. Um, thank, thanks a lot. Um, and anybody has any questions, maybe uh, they can be also put into the chat window, um, uh, which um, you have available to you. Um, I was going to say, though, because um, there was a couple of, um, you know, really interesting, there was a lot of really interesting projects, but um, like you talked a little bit about the fact that um, um, Trend Solar uh, occupies a a kind of a, a a certain place in in the kind of uh, when you think about design teams and how they're traditionally composed. You know, you have uh, structural, you have the architect, you have structural engineers, you have mechanical and electrical engineers. You might have a quantity surveyor, and you know, Transolar doesn't really have a place in that. And I think you 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 spoke to this pretty pretty clearly about about what your um, what what your role as a catalyst is, um, and um, at the same time, you know, we kind of see in the projects always uh, a very strong um, influence, which sometimes has a, you know, kind of aesthetic consequences, which has uh, spatial consequences, which has, you know, consequences in terms of cost and planning and, you know, so on. Um, and uh, I think that this kind of speaks a little bit to the, to the challenge of how we think about uh, how, how we as, um, let's say, technically trained professionals are, are dealing with the problem of climate change. In other words, is there enough um, uh, of the things that you mentioned, like innovation, creativity, I suppose the things that, you know, within uh, any kind of architectural parlance would just be kind of considered to be the norm, you know, that's kind of what we do or whatever. Is it directed at the right things? Um, does it have the right kind of outcomes? Are our systems correctly configured to even think about them? Um, and this is kind of uh, a question that, I mean, it's a very big question, but you, in so many ways, it comes up in all of the different projects that you showed um, about how, you know, projects capitulate in a sense to other kinds of concerns and how does Transolar's um, kind of extremely, and you didn't present this, as you said, you didn't show any of your uh, simulations and charts and, and the kind of evidence base that's necessary to uh, push any kind of, um, uh, you know, kind of uh, solution forward uh, with kind of credibility um, is, uh, is, 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 a, is an enormous piece of work. You know, it's not something that you just do in a, it's not a, you might have some sense of how things might be, but, but in order to really, uh, uh, prove something, uh, it needs to go through a series of steps. And those steps, um, you know, from at least my experience and perspective, do not always form part of a design process. Um, and uh, I, I think that this is something that, I mean, maybe this isn't a question, it's just a kind of my, my, my observation about, um, you know, working with Transolar for, for a long time, but also the, 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 the um, the critical importance of the questions that you raise, the critical importance of the knowledge that you build in any design process, um, and and you know how that how that kind of um, how that transforms architecture um, and how it can transform architecture. Um, there's a bunch of questions that are appearing in the chat um, as I'm as I was just. <laughs> saying that, so maybe we'll go through those also first. Um, Mark Stevens is asking about, can you read those actually, Eric, rather than I can. read them out? Yeah, um, yeah no, I can read, I've seen them also. They're all really good questions. Um, 
Maybe I would just say first in response to your, your statement, I was also wondering if there was a question. But yeah, but the is <laughs> sorry about it, that. Yeah. It, no, no, it's it, it requires I mean, we need good clients, the same as good as architects need good clients. I mean, maybe that's just a kind of trite statement, but like in, in the States, we're very successful with on higher ed projects because universities are one of the few clients that understand the importance of addressing climate change and also have very sophisticated facilities groups, especially at the larger universities that actually are able to engage in this kind of conversation. And even then it's a difficult conversation of like, how are you going to change? It's such a conservative industry. And the assumption is that you will just continue with business as usual because the risk of doing anything else is seen as being so high. And actually I was, I was actually having a discussion the other day that perhaps we need to push even harder in our early framing with clients of like, look, you think this is high risk, but the look how risk high the risk is if you do nothing, because if you just continue with business as usual, then you are just contributing to climate change. And we actually had started, we paused, lost for a while because it was too difficult. We wanted to make the connection between if you continue with business as usual or only do a little bit, then you, you, your contribution toward a continued path of global warming is if everybody behaved in the same way as you behave, then that would result in global temperature rise of 2.5 or 3C or whatever it, it is and have some way of translating. It's such a huge gap between your personal action and global impact. And I, I don't think we know how to do that yet, but I thought about using that as a way to further push clients where, where necessary, even like, We've been working, I, I've been trying to diversify to developer type clients, which are very difficult. Um, and so far, the realization is we only have a hope with them. Number one, if they already know they need to do something different, if they already say, yes, we're not just going to recreate our model of building that we know how to build, where we just make some new window dressing of what it looks like, but everything else technically is just what we, what we think we know how to do. They have to be prepared for that but that's not enough. They also have to have more time because they're used to these extremely fast design processes that don't really have any of the kind of consideration that we bring. And that just doesn't work until the, but they don't know financially how to make their business work if they don't always work in those very short time frames, unless they're forced to by, you know, entitlements problems of some kind to do otherwise. So. I mean, just on more. that, I maybe want to introduce a couple of the questions because the, the 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 first one is around passive passive house, which I think is interesting because you know definitely you know people are looking at you know kind of certified systems or certified methodologies um, for achieving you know sustainability in inverted commas, and um, the first question kind of points to that. Yeah, the uh, so, so the first question about Hyundai and mechanical systems. Don't don't overinterpret what I present because it is from a, a, an American lens inevitably. Where when we when I say natural ventilation, it almost always means hybrid. Probably of everything I showed, if I flip through it in my head, the only project that doesn't have any mechanical systems is Damascus. Like most of those projects, especially in more extreme climates, we put a big emphasis on you should be able to operate in a natural mode for as much as you of the year as you can, um, but then it becomes extreme and it's very difficult to maintain comfort and be energy efficient. So you switch to a mechanical mode. And so, I mean, every, all, almost every project has minimum mechanical ventilation with heat recovery and then some other form, often radiant, could be other things of, uh, of heating and cooling, especially in North America, in Asia and so on. Um, I would just say with regarding passive house, the critique of passive house is kind of exactly coming back to my point of mediate and engage passive house as a rating system and as a framework. It doesn't tell you that you can't engage. It doesn't prohibit natural ventilation, but it doesn't encourage it either. It only addresses the mediate and therefore you can e easily fall into this trap of only focusing on the mediate side of the design. And we're trying to push that we should do both uh, to whatever extent is appropriate, depending on the climate. 
I mean, just on that, I think the next question is pretty interesting. Um, Jan Froberg is asking uh, for a comment on the Baumschlager Erbele's 2026 concept and how this compares to Transolar's approach. And then more broadly, do you see the emergence of a set of universally accepted approaches to environmental design in buildings? Um, so the Baumschlager Erbele 2026 house, if, if, for anyone that doesn't, doesn't know it, definitely uh, we know it. It's like, uh, designed with no systems at all in the 2026 are the, is supposed to maintain temperatures between 20 and 26 C, is my understanding. Um, and it's in Austria. Um, and I, I think that's, it's a super interesting project and I've shown it in lectures before. And it, so it's, it's absolutely very relevant to our work and not, not so different. Um, it requires some acceptance of what is the variation in temperature? When can you occupy it? I think they have certain times that they, you know, they, they occupy it too much at night in the winter, then they'll begin to have problems. Also, there's certain assumptions there about internal heat gain um, because they're reliant on internal heat gain from equipment and so on to heat the space, which basically leads exactly to all of the, especially in North American practice, I feel we spend so much time engaging with the client on their expectations and on the assumptions and so on, how it's going to, if you're going to rely on a completely passive system as that does, it becomes very, very dependent upon how you operate it. And so they have a lot of flexibility because that's their own office. It was completely up to them to set the, the boundaries for how they, they do that, which is just a wonderful opportunity. I think that this, this point of wider universally accepted approaches to environmental design, um, there are not anything completely universal because it should always vary by climate and it can be quite different according to climate. But even within one climate, uh, unfortunately, I, I, I don't think so yet. Like there's a lot of different experimentation and things happening and um, sometimes even disagreement on what the right thing to do is. Yeah, I mean, it's a very, I think it's a really interesting question because the, I mean, and you, you pointed a little bit to the question around natural ventilation. Um, and maybe this kind of gets us into Steph's question around um, the accessibility of your, of Transolar solutions. Um, and uh, does it increase the cost of uh, the design phase, which is kind of uh, an interesting question, and in, particularly in relation to what, what I was uh, getting at a few minutes ago. Um, and does that fuel any skepticism? And I suppose what you mean by that is, does it fuel skepticism about the approach? Um, uh, maybe you could speak to that, because I think that might be a nice way to, to finish up as we're kind of closing uh, in towards 2 p.m. That it's a, it's a good question and certainly one we struggle with. Like we are an extra on projects. Nobody needs our work to get a building built and working. Um, but if you want to take a certain approach, uh, then it becomes very important. So absolutely increases cost and design phase. Maybe there's an argument to be made that that is saved by long-term operation costs. Um, regarding being prohibitive for smaller scale projects, we do work on a lot of smaller scale projects. You know, this, I mean, this Hyundai example that I end with is actually a fairly small scale project. And we have uh, a lot of uh, others as well. And we try very much to keep our fees commensurate uh, with the scale of those projects. Of course, things don't scale perfectly, but uh, so that I mean, we can you spoke do, also we can about do what we do, what we can on, on those. And I would say we have, they, they also tend to be simpler. There's the one nice thing that helps that is like smaller projects, they tend to be simpler. The floor plates are, the programs are usually simpler. The floor plates are shallower, which makes things much easier and so on, such that we can do, we can have good impact with less time spent on the project. I, yeah, I think that that's, I mean, I was just going to mention also that, that you, you mentioned this in your introduction, Eric, the Transolar Academy and the fact that you're working in a lot of places that, you know, are not, are not part of, uh, you know, kind of the Western world, as it were. Um, and I think, uh, I, I, I think that's a kind of a, speaks to your own uh, attempts to, uh, you know, to make accessible the approach, but also to, to treat it as part of an educational system. Um, which needs to kind of broaden um, as, a, as a philosophy. But listen, uh, just to kind of, I'll hand back over to Hugh, but I just wanted to thank you very much for joining us. Uh, it's been really, uh, really fantastic. And 
Um, uh, we really appreciate your, 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 your time this morning and this afternoon for us. I'll hand it back over to you, Hugh. Thank, thanks, Marilyn. Thank you very much, Eric. That was really uh, fascinating. Great. I mean, and actually, interestingly, Transcell are our involved in the project going on in UCD for the where the new school of architecture is going to be of course right yeah yeah um, we, we, were, we were on we were on several teams my team lost and Matthias's team won uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well either way we're kind of getting, <laughs> oh it's all good we're getting <laughs> some of your your magic I, I did have a small question Eric but maybe I can hold it <clears throat> I suppose no I'm just gonna I'm okay I'm okay if you want to go for it. <laughs> Which was about just, I mean, the range of architects, um, you know, many internationally renowned that you were, you know, um, pop, were popping up through your examples. And, and I suppose in, in other terms, one would think of them as, them as representing quite diverse, let's say, design philosophies, aesthetics, and so on, from Sana to Jean Nouvel to... Um, Stephen Hall to whoever it is. And so do you find that their approach to your input is, is quite different? Or do, they, do you think that there's a sort of common currency in terms of the way that they come, come to you and, and what they want to get? I would say across the, the individuals, yes, there, there is some difference. And, you know, every new architect requires you, you really get to know each other on the second project because you're just trying to figure out how to work together on the first project. Um, but beyond that, and here I, I best not name names, at the, but, uh, but it, I, I very much categorize the architects we work with as falling into two very distinct categories. Almost everyone I could, can, you can slot into one, one or category or the other. And so one category is those, they have very strong design ideas. Um, and, and our work is probably not going to shape the initial approach to the site or to the problem of the project or whatever. Or they have a very strong vision, but then they want our help to make it smart and make it work and make it be uh, environmentally responsible and climate responsive and so on. Then there's another set of architects who really, they want to do an integrated design from the ground up where uh, they really want our input to help shaping the uh, every aspect of the project. Mer Merit's here, so I can say Merit is clearly in the second category. There's no doubt no there. Okay. <laughs> so and both of those are both of those are fine because there's something happily, to gain happily from both in of those. the second category as well. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> there's, 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 but there's 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 plenty. There's something to be gained from both of those because the first one often are the big budget projects that. That they're, they're where you get technology, pushing the envelope on technology and you get the opportunity for this technological innovation and pushing yourself uh, in a way that you often just won't get otherwise. 